Good morning, people of God. You know, we, we are broken people uh, uh, gathered by God. And uh, not only us, the projector is broken today. So this, one <laughs> so this side is not working, so we have to trouble everyone to strain your eyes to this side of the, of the projector. Is that okay? All right. Let, let me just pre- start by preparing our hearts with a passage from the Psalms. I think this morning as we prepare our hearts and mind to come and worship our Lord, let us be reminded by David's prayer in Psalms 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Shall we stand? We have come together as the family of God in our Father's presence to offer Him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive His holy word, to bring before Him the needs of the world, to ask His forgiveness of our sins, and to seek His grace. And through His Son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to His service. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So brothers and sisters, let us confess our sins to the Almighty God. Shall we sit or kneel? Together, let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Receive God's forgiveness, church. Almighty God forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon, deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Shall we rise, people of God, with joy? Let's worship God. Spirit born is 
Lord, we praise you, Lord. Praise you for you are good, Lord, and you are faithful. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are a faithful God who remembers your people. And Lord, forgive us for the times that we forget who you are.
you are faithful, God, and you will not forget us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for being with us in every season. And we thank you for this reminder, Lord, that you are our refuge, that you are our strength. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. James, chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A very good morning. We plan it. All right. That's ah okay. Yesterday we also experienced some technical issues. Uh, perhaps someone doesn't want me to share this message. <laughs> Okay, good morning everyone. It's good to uh, share God's word with you and we are continuing in our sermon series on the book of James. Everyone discipled, wise living in a foolish world. And I've titled the sermon, The Nest and the Crown, Building God, Godly Character. So what is the significance of the bird nest? Some of you are probably buying bird nests for Chinese New Year banquet. Eh? Uh, we will explore together later. So how do we build a godly character in a world full of trials and temptation? Before I begin, let's commit this time to the Lord. Father, we thank you that we can come at your feet to receive your truth and your love. We hold on to your promise that your word brings us life, joy, and freedom. Help us not to be just hearers, but doers of your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So friends, uh, raise up your hand if you woke up this morning and were so tempted to go back to sleep instead of coming to church. Ah, oh, so many honesty. And the rest of you, <laughs> eager to come to church. Praise the Lord. Raise up your hand if you are tempted to take out your handphone right now and scroll through Instagram or Facebook. Or even right now, perhaps you're already <laughs> scrolling through Facebook. Raise up your hand if you are tempted to let your mind wander during my sermon and you'll be asking yourself, what should I eat for lunch later? Or what should I buy with my CDC voucher? 
or how much new money should I change for Chinese New Year? Has Pastor Harley put on weight since Christmas? <laughs> so some of this uh, mind will start to uh, float, right? So all of us face temptation on a daily basis. And like this, right? Uh, the, 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 the desire and the temptation to just go through Facebook and so on. Like watching TikTok or impulse online shopping. Others can be more insidious, like greed, lust, and hatred. Tempted to covet someone or cheat to get ahead. Lasted to, uh, tempted to lust and indulge in pornography, fornication, or adultery. Tempted to be arrogant, bitter, hateful, and seek revenge. And people of God in the Bible were also exposed to temptation. In the earliest human history, we have Adam and Eve who, was, who were tempted by the serpent to eat from the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because of their disobedience to God, they brought sin into our world. And we also have Moses who was tempted to anger and impatience, striking the rock twice and Mariba to bring forth water instead of trusting God's instruction. This act resulted in him being denied entry into the promised land. And famously, we have King David who lusted after his commander's wife, Bathsheba. He not only committed adultery, but plotted the murder of Bathsheba's husband to cover up his own sins. This led to a series of devastating consequences for him and his family. So friends, you may be wondering, the people of God were so weak, so vulnerable. They fell so easily into temptation and sin against God. Friends, you are in good company with fellow saints. If you are struggling with temptations, it makes us perfectly human that we succumb so easily to sin. So you may ask, why did God make us so weak, so vulnerable? Why can't we have the strength to overcome these temptation. What makes it worse is that temptations are everywhere. We live in a fallen world where every sight, every sound, every smell can entice us away from God. There is a saying about temptation by the reformer Martin Luther. They are like birds in the air. Let me read to you what he wrote. You cannot prevent the birds from flying over your head but you can prevent them from building a nest in your hair. It acknowledges that we cannot always avoid being tempted, tempted. We cannot control the birds flying overhead. However, we have the choice to entertain those temptations and allow them to take root within us. We can also choose to shoo them away before they build a nest. So back to the question. Why did God make us so weak, so vulnerable, that we easily succumb to temptation? Actually, it's not a sign of weakness. In God's perfect will, He created us with the ability to choose what is right and what is wrong. God did not create us like robots who would obey Him blindly and unreservedly. God also did not create us to be like animals that only think and act with their primal instincts. So unlike robots or animals, God wants us to choose, to choose to love and obey God. When God created us, He took the risk of granting us the free will to love and obey Him and to also fall into temptation and sin against Him. This is God's perfect will that he allow us to choose freely. Even though temptations are everywhere and we have the free will to choose, we cannot blame God for tempting us. And this is what James writes in verse 13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. Our God is inherently good and holy. He cannot 
be tempted to do evil or tempts people to do evil. The Apostle John writes that God is light. In Him is no darkness at all. So God's love for humanity is central to His nature and message. Tempting people to sin would directly contradict, contradict His desire for our holiness and well-being. Even though we know that God is good and holy, we sometimes blame God when we fall into sin. Take the example of Adam who blamed God. He said, the woman, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. So friends, have you ever blamed God for your sinful decision? God, why did you make me fall in love with that woman who is not my wife? Or oh, why did you make me so good looking that women are throwing themselves at me? <laughs> why did you make me so rich that I must lie and cheat to maintain my lavish lifestyle? If we honestly examine ourselves, we have no one to blame but ourselves. Temptations surround us daily and it is easy to blame God for all these things and to blame others as well. However, James reminds us that temptation arises from our own desires which produce sin and spiritual death. In verse, verse 14, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. In our Christian life, we often target the sin. But James is telling us to go further to the source of our sins, which is our desires. As pastors, we often tell people to stop sinning. But we should also remind them to examine the root issues of why they are sinning. What are the desires that cause us to indulge in sin? Why do we often allow the birds to build a nest on our heads? Let me illustrate this process with a picture of a fruit tree. The fruits are our sinful deeds and actions which grow from the seeds of our desires. And our desires are rooted from something ancient, primal, from the times of Adam and Eve. Desires are not bad per se, but they can be corrupted by the devil and our fallen nature. For example, the desire to be loved is good, but it can be corrupted to become an overwhelming obsession to, um, of unhealthy attachments and relationships. For example, our desire to be loved may lead us to pursue a promiscuous lifestyle. So friends, what are your common desires. Last week, we read the temptation of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 4. The devil knows our weaknesses and targets Jesus in three areas of human desires. First is my favorite target, stomach. This is our desire to satisfy our physical need. In Luke chapter 4, verse 3, the devil said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. There's nothing wrong for Jesus to satisfy his desire to eat and survive. But the devil is tempting Jesus to use his divine power to change stone to bread, to ease his hunger pangs and discomfort. The devil's temptation is very familiar for us today. He's like saying to all of us, if you are a Christian, if you are a child of God, why are you suffering? Why don't you take control of your life and do something about it? Take shortcuts and just give in to your desires. Gratify yourself now, you deserve it. Your personal comfort and satisfaction are more important 
than what God has in store for you. The second target of our desire is our eyes. Our eyes are vulnerable because we are attracted by things of beauty, status, and magnificence. The devil's the devil exploits our desire to possess things of beauty and power. It is not wrong for us to desire beautiful things and excel, but it can lead to greed and obsession for power and status. And the devil, let me read this passage from Luke again. And the devil took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The devil tried to tempt Jesus with beautiful and wondrous treasures. Come and worship me, and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. The devil was offering another shortcut for Jesus to be ruler. However, the path for Jesus to be ruler of all is the way of the cross. Today, the devil plays on this desire for wealth and status. We are constantly bombarded with images of worldly pleasures and decadent materialism. They make us so discontented with ourselves and covetous of other people. We, make, we must make more money, upgrade, level up, outdo each other to be richer and more powerful. It is a vicious cycle. We will never have enough. We will never be contented. The third target of our desire is our hearts of devotion. It is our desire to be accepted, to be valued and protected. There are good desires, but the devil can exploit them for his wicked ends. Let me read to you again the passage from Luke. And the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the, your God to the test. In this third temptation, the devil prayed on Jesus' relationship with God the Father, making him doubt God's goodness and faithfulness. He challenged Jesus to throw himself off the top of the temple. Surely God would not allow his beloved son to hurt himself. The devil wanted Jesus to prove that God is faithful, but such a test does not prove faithfulness, but foolishness. Today, friends, we are receiving the same propaganda from the devil and the world. Are you sure God will take care of you? Are you sure you are accepted by God? Are you sure God loves you? Prove it. Throw yourself down into more work, more service, more activities. I think you, do, I need, I think you need to do more to prove your worth. You need to do more to prove that God loves and accepts you. This is a false sense of security and acceptance. This is the lie of the devil and the world to make us doubt. God's love and faithfulness. As a pastor, I'm sometimes guilty of doubting my own worth and relationship with God. I harbor the false beliefs that I must prove God's love and acceptance for me by doing more things for Him. I even tell people that if you don't, if you don't experience God's love, you probably need to pray more and read the Bible more. 
You need to do more church or religious activities to be accepted and loved by God. How foolish I was. I'm not saying that praying or reading the Bible is bad, but we can use them to puff our self-importance, pride and ego. I thought that by being busier and more productive, I could test God's love and acceptance for me. My desire to be loved and accepted has been corrupted by the devil and my false beliefs. And I was tempted to prove my worth by doing more for God. And I allowed the birds of self-righteousness, legalism, self-rejection, and pride to build their nests on my head. I forgot that Jesus loves and accepts me for who I am, regardless of my doing, my ministry, and my productivity. Friends, let me tell you that God loves and accepts you even if you cannot do anything for yourself and for God. And so I don't need to earn God's love and acceptance for me. I'm reminded by the passage in Romans chapter 5. God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for you and for me. And he reconciled and accepted us by his death and life. Coming back to the picture of the fruit tree, to help us overcome our sinful habits and deeds, we need to target the roots of our desires. We need to expose them to the Father of lights and the truth of the gospel. James writes in verse 17, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation of shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So friends, our God is a God of, uh, is the source of all good things. He is the father of lights because he is the ultimate source of goodness and purity. He is unchanging, and reliable. Unlike the sun, which moves across the sky and casts shadows. So friends, this is our assurance as we ask God to examine the roots of our desires. And we pray to God, Lord, I thank you for our desires, but there are times when they have been corrupted by the devil and our own flesh. Please show us how to handle these desires which caused us to sin against you and other people. God also gave us the gift of life through his word, the word of truth in this passage. is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is good news for us that God loves and has made a way for us to be reconciled to him. So, my friends, we are special to God. We are called a kind of first fruits of all he created. We are his first creatures who were made in God's image and given the ability to choose, to know, and to love him. This means that we have the responsibility to glorify God and to live according to his will. And we also have the responsibility to examine the roots of our desires, good and bad, according to God's truth. As I mentioned earlier, our desires can be hijacked by the devil and the world. So let us allow God's truth to scrutinize our desires. Any desire that leads to sin and death, we must ask our loving God to expose and deal with it in His light and truth. Earlier, I shared that I struggle with self-worth. As the youngest of five children... I was often left alone to play and be by myself. I knew I was loved by my family, but I longed for their affection and attention. Through the years, my desire to be loved and accepted became warped by the devil and his lies. I didn't know Jesus then, and I always felt I had to prove 
my worth with my family, with my friends, school, and society. This corrupted seed of desire took root. It grew and grew and grew and bore the sinful fruits of bitterness, self-hate, lust, and even pride. I became bitter and hated myself when I feel rejected by my friends and society. I use pornography and gluttony to feel the emptiness of not being loved and accepted. The lie of the devil is that porn and food do not, do not reject you, but they will gnaw away your soul bit by bit. Ironically, even though I had a low view of myself, I bore the sin of pride and superiority. I used material things and my personal achievements to fortify my dwindling self-esteem and security. How foolish I was. I carried the heaviness of all these sinful desires and deeds on my head. The birds were pecking away on my soul and well-being. Thankfully, I met Jesus who loves and accepts me. God promised the crown of life to those who accepts and follows him. And this is what James writes in verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. And this is God's promise for all of us. After becoming a, becoming a Christian and even a pastor, do you think the seeds of my corrupted desires vanish overnight? What do you guys think? No. They didn't. Sometimes they grew worse because of spiritual opposition and warfare. And I had to constantly expose them one by one, to the light and truth of God. I had to surrender and ask God to cleanse and redeem my false and corrupted desires. And I'm still in the process of being sanctified by God, who is refining and molding me. It is painful, but necessary and eventually glorious. Concerning my desire to be accepted and loved, the devil can still tempt me as a pastor, if you are a servant of God, do more, preach more, teach more, minister more. He never say pray more. Lah. Okay. Serve more, pastor more, prove yourself more so that God will love and accept you more. It's incredibly insidious because the lie and temptation can be very, very subtle. And we don't realize it until it's too late. The overdoing and overachieving can lead to a sense of pride and self-entitlement. Sadly, several prominent Christian leaders have fallen into this trap and have been asked to step down from their leadership positions. Sex and money are usually the main two temptations of our modern time. Like how Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, they target the desire of our stomach, eyes, and heart. And we use sex and money to satisfy our sinful desires. Thankfully, we don't have to helplessly allow the birds to build their nests on our heads. God has given us the crown of life. But before doing that, he has shown us the crown of thorns in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our Lord Jesus is our high priest who has experienced all desires and temptation, but have overcome them at the cross. As such, we are no longer slaves to our sinful desires and habits. Our Lord Jesus can help and redeem all our desires for his good and glory. The writer to Hebrews writes, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence, with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive his mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So friends, this is our confidence that we can remove our nests of sinful past and present for the crown of life. Jesus knows and will help us. We no longer need to hide from our sinful desires and habits. We bring them to the light and the truth of our Lord Jesus, who knows and loves us very much and desires for us to be whole. I want to end with the comforting words from James. Verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So let's just spend the time to talk to God. The Lord is here with us this morning. I want to give you the opportunity to speak to our Lord Jesus. His Spirit is with us. I invite you to just close your eyes and focus on Jesus. Focus on the cross. O oh Lord, search our hearts. Speak to Jesus. He is here with us. Will you tell God your struggles, your sinful desires and habits? Offer them to the light and truth of God. The devil wants us to hide and remain in the shadows of our shame and guilt. But the first step to be free from our sins is to come out from hiding and into the light and love of God. So people of God, stop hiding. Come out into God's loving light and truth. Lord Jesus, go deeply into my root issues and struggles. We are tired of repeating the same cycle of sinning and asking for your forgiveness. Prune, cleanse, and redeem the seeds of our desires. We give you the desires of our stomach eyes and heart. Redeem them, Lord, in your light and the truth of your word. We don't need to gratify our desires for worldly pleasures because you are enough for us. Would you tell God you are enough, you are sufficient. exchange all my false desires for godly desires. You love us. You accept us. We can come to you freely, broken, weak, vulnerable. We don't have to put on a mask with you, Lord Jesus. You welcome us. So have mercy on us.
just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relief, because thy promise, I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. So we come to you, Lord Jesus, cleanse us, prune us, redeem us, bless us with your grace and your love. We ask all this in your most precious name. Amen. People of God, we just received the word of the Lord. Now let us respond to our Lord by affirming our common faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. Shall we stand? Together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and Spirit, that you enable and empower us to do so. We also ask, Holy Spirit, that you transform and sanctify us so that we may have the strength to overcome and so that, Lord, our life may be like that of our beloved Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord, now we pray for the Diocese of Singapore. O oh God, our eternal shepherd, who leads your flock in love and holiness through your appointed servants. We thank you for installing Archbishop Titus Chung over your people in the Anglican Church of the province of Southeast Asia. Strengthen our Archbishop with your heavenly grace. Grant him the servant mind of Christ and empower him mightily by your Holy Spirit that may, he may serve the Lord faithfully and lead the province, including the Diocese of Singapore, into a time of spiritual revival. We also pray for his family. Bless and protect his wife Connie, his sons Thaddeus and Theodore as the journey with him in this season. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For us here in St. James's Church, help us, O God, to seek earnestly and receive humbly the infilling of the Holy Spirit 
so that Christ may dwell richly in our hearts through faith. May we in St. James's Church be enabled by the Holy Spirit to grasp the breadth, the length, the height, the depth of God's unfailing love for us in Christ. Give us grace to serve and love one another that the world may know we are truly Christ's disciples. Help us, Lord, to live a life that is surrendered to your good and perfect will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now for the world, we pray for your protection and preservation of lives in war-torn Ukraine, Gaza and Myanmar. We seek your mercy and grace for all who are afflicted by these wars. May those who do not have enough for their needs receive from your compassionate hand. Those who are suffering in body and mind find deep healing and comfort. Those who are fearful strengthen by your glorious hope. And those who are displaced, may you lead them by your grace to a place that is safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for Singapore, we pray for the international students in our midst who are drawn to our country as a prominent educational hub. We pray not only that they have a positive experience with us and receive a good education. Oh Lord, bring about an opportunity for them to hear the gospel and be saved. Inspire church ministries and organizations to reach out to the international students with love in action and the gospel truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So people of God, let us now pray for ourselves and for those whom we know are hurting, whether in body, mind or spirit. Let us take a quiet moment to lift each of them to the Lord. experience the love, joy, peace and comfort that only our God can give. Lastly, Lord, we want to bring ourselves before you as we give our tithes and offerings. We thank you for your gracious provision in our lives and we pray that you may use what we offer for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom. Together we say, Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may I invite all of us to stand for the offertory song.
Very good morning and welcome to our 9 a.m. service here in St. James. I am Pastor Siang Guan and I just want to take a few moments if there are newcomers among us, maybe this is your first or second time worshipping with us, could you just give me a little wave so that I can acknowledge your presence? Yes. Welcome, brother. Yes. Are there any from this side? Well, the host is going to come and give you a welcome pack. Uh, do stay in touch with us. Join us for coffee and breakfast down after this, all right? Very good. Uh, let me give us the announcements for this week. First up, really, is our church camp, all right? Now, this is the last weekend before the early bird closes uh, at the end of this month, 31st of January. So, please take... Uh, advantage of this because after that, the price will go up by $30 per person uh, from there on, all right? I just want to maybe quickly say that, as I've been saying uh, over the past few weeks, if there are people, if this really cost is a matter, please speak to your uh, cell group leaders. If you are part of a cell group or perhaps just come and speak to myself or any one of the clergy, we'll be really uh, wanting to help you be with the family at this uh, uh, church camp. So do not let cost be an uh, obstacle for you coming, all right? So, yeah, the rest of it you can see in the SJC updates and do sign up using the QR code, all right? So that's first thing. The second thing is really, uh, well, the season of Lent is also coming very, very soon, uh, it will start on the 14th of February and Lent is really one of the major uh, highlights in our Christian year. And, you know, we would like to prepare ourselves in that journey as we come towards uh, Good Friday, Easter. And I want to commend to you the service for Ash Wednesday that will commence uh, on the 14th of February. Uh, do come and join us 8 p.m. in this sanctuary. All right, so this is really something to put in your calendar. So, and it's part of what we have been saying, uh, being more intentional to come back even to the way our liturgy, our service order, our, our, uh, the Christian year, uh, how it shapes us in our own spirituality, especially as Anglicans. All right? So, good. Well, last but not least, I want to invite uh, Tiffany Hayborn to come up. Come, Tiffany. Now... You're not seeing double if you thought that you uh, are seeing Angelina, who actually last year went to Lak Prabang to serve with Cornerstone uh, Student Centre. Tiffany is one of the triplets, yeah? And she herself too, God has led her to want to volunteer, uh, take a gap year, this one year to serve in uh, Lak Prabang. So I just want her to share a little bit before we pray for her after this. Come, Tiffany. Hello. Good morning, church. Um, I don't know why I'm so surprised. I'm not a morning person myself. So like the 9 a.m. service, there's so many people. I don't know why I'm surprised. <laughs> but hello, it's nice to see everyone. Um, my name is Tiffany Hayborn. I am the third triplet out of a set of three. Um, I recently graduated from university and have decided to go to Bangkok, Thailand for one year um, to teach English at Cornerstone, which is the Student Outreach Centre located in La Krabang. Um, yeah, it offers free English lessons to local Thai students in the area. Um, yeah, so I'm a fresh graduate-ish. I graduated in July. Um, and I just want to dedicate my first fruits to God. Um, I want to commit my time, my availability, what's left of my youth. I turned 24 on Friday. Um, yeah. And yeah, and I want to give him my gifts to serve him and his kingdom. Um, for a year, and we'll see where the Lord takes me there. Um, yeah, so I would love you to pray with me and for me. Um, I fly on Friday, so journey mercy and a smooth arrival in Thailand would be great. Um, that I keep my eyes focused on Jesus as, like, throughout all the changes and adjustments, that I would be teachable and um, humble with every learning curve. Yeah, and finally, sensitive to the Spirit and what He wants to do in me and through me in my time there. So, yeah, I would love for you to pray for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tiffany. Can I invite Pastor John and Pastor Harley to just come and join me? Church, let us stretch our hands and commit Tiffany as she gives of this next one year to the Lord. Father, we just thank you 
that you are the God who gives to us every good and perfect gift. And Lord, we commend Tiffany to you. And even as she begins this one year of exciting journey, following after you and your call, Tiffany, may you be like what the psalmist says, I lift up my eyes to the hills and from where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. He has made the heaven and earth. You will not let Tiffany's foot be moved, Lord. You who neither slumber nor sleep. You who have kept Israel. You are watching over our dear sister. So the Lord be your keeper. The Lord be your shade on your right hand. The Lord watches over you that the sun, the moon, nor any of the evil intent of the evil one may have its effect upon you. So may you go forth with that confidence that the Lord will keep you from all evil. He keeps your life. He fulfills the desire of your hearts even as you desire to honour him so that you're going out, you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore will always be blessed because he is with you. So Lord, thank you and we look forward even in the days to come as we continue to stand with our sister and the work in Lakrabang and also in, in Cornerstone. This gospel will continue to just touch and transform lives. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Come. Well, with that, let us now stand, shall we? Let's receive the blessing of the Lord as we draw this service to a close before we sing our final song. Let's say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.
make your sound confession to 